going live in five. All right, two minutes. Two minutes. One
All right. I'm going to wait a minute or two for uh, a couple more people to join in. I will be using uh, charcoal today. I've got general soft, 6B, 4B, uh, another brand right here. Just whatever I have. I'm gonna start in charcoal today on this nice sandy color paper. And my real goal is to be using these pan pastels again. I have this lovely image of Cerebella. I have it actually on a screen in front of me, but for the purpose of today, because I know some of the people will want to uh, have this be more of a lesson, I printed something out so that I could show some of the measurements that I'm seeing uh, above as well. So I'll use this for kind of the theory. Uh, and examples, if you have uh, a printout at home, you're welcome to kind of fold it and get an idea of what we're working with. So today, rather than just me draw, I'm going to be somewhat instructive, but I'm really, my goal is to take my time. So I'm going to be very deliberate. We'll see how far we get. What I love about this pose, uh, this was actually not a pose. Uh, I did a photo session with my friend Sarah a long time ago, and this was in between uh, poses. I think I had said something silly and she had just finished uh, laughing. My experience with Sarah as a model was basically uh, she got up on the model stand and I had the camera ready and she was like, go, and I was like, click, 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 and she assumed all the poses. So we did up, we did sitting, we did turning, and then she lays down and does a whole bunch of poses. And it's at this point, right before this point, she says to me, you want anything else? Uh, I hadn't called out directions, I hadn't told her to turn. There was, she was so skilled um, that I really didn't have to do anything. <laughs> um, she was such a pro, but I kept just clicking, and this was one of those poses that happened um, in, in between those moments, really. So I'm just going to back off the camera and show you the, the setup. There's going to be probably a lot of camera changes. I know that uh, Jeff really liked those. Um, so, I mean, the size of the screen that I have her on here, uh, that would mean she's about 20 feet away from me. And I'm normally not that far from the model. But I don't want the screen right here. I don't want to be able to touch it. I still want to look outside of myself and my body because I'm really still trying to practice not to draw from photo, but eventually to draw again from life. And life is going to be away from me. Uh, if the person's too close, they're not going to fit on your paper anyway, so they're going to be too big. So throughout this process, the camera angle will be changing, which Hopefully it will be dynamic and interesting. If you're out there following along, like my student Dave, he has been uh, handing in his drawings, which is great. If you guys want to do that, you can definitely do that. So before we begin, setting the timer, 25 minutes, the Pontemoro timing. Supposedly this is the uh, scientifically proven amount of time that we humans can focus. Our best and brightest is at the very beginning of the 25 minutes. We kind of plateau along and right at the end we have a strong memory of what just occurred, so the last thing we did, but after about 25 minutes we lose our focus. So we as artists, it's a good idea to take advantage of this and not just try to uh, cram for four hours. We will uh, Take a little break, rest our eyes, look away from the piece, get away from our space, but when we come back, we'll be fresh again and we'll be able to analyze what we're doing. My first goal being that I am going to begin with a lay-in. Um, one thing too I wanted to show is I folded it down the middle and the reason for this was to be able to show you that the reason I have a horizontal page 
is because this image is horizontal and long. And if I take my hand and I measure from her foot to the middle, I get this distance, and I can move that here. So what's happening is I have two units here. Okay. If I take that measurement and I flip it horizontally and I take a look, I would be able to fit half. Okay. So she's two by half. So I'm going to think in my mind of this crosshair. In fact, maybe I'll draw it for you. Um, there's a lot of beautiful, complicated things and angles. So this kind of pose might really intimidate you at first, but we're going to uh, break it down piecemeal and work things out. And today I'm going to draw uh, not as much like a classical drawing, but I'm going to try to explain and describe the shapes. Okay. So how is this leg in front and coming towards me? Um, because I'm going to start with the dark. After that's done, and I take a break, we'll come back, we'll see what we need to do, and then I'll get into the pastel. Whoa! Just dropped a thing here. Okay. Let's see how our angle is. So 25 minutes. Get yourself situated and ready. And we'll begin. What? Malfunction. Okay, now it's working. What? What's going on here? Every time I touch a magnet, I don't know. Whoops, I added a minute. So I'll just stick this aside for a moment. I always like to feel and smooth out the paper a little bit. Um, and I will put that crosshair in there very lightly. I'm using the long pointy end. Hopefully you're sharpened. So I'm going to use angles at first. So to get this much length, half of it will be the hip. So in this case, I don't necessarily want to start with the head length, but I am going to limit how far I'm drawing. So when we're working vertical, we put a line at the top and a line at the, the bottom here, but here it's the side. Her head actually, um, Get a spot for it. We have that hard angle where the head is uh, foreshortened, turning away. So that's going to be fun. Figure out how to solve that problem. So I figure it's going to start around here. Find your way around. None of this is, uh, a lot of it's guessing. None of this is a commitment at all yet. I could move the whole head. I can erase it. I can start over if I need to. So don't be afraid to make marks because it's the marks um, that you have to react to. You can't do it without some um, big, simple shapes though. If you have the dexterity, you're welcome to turn uh, within your lines. Otherwise, just keep them fairly straight. Okay. 
that distance is about the same, at least according to my eyes. You can also hold this up, look at the model, and copy an angle. I love that technique. I discovered it on my own, actually. Um, I didn't take drawing in school, really. Yeah, I mean, there was mandatory drawing that you had to take. I actually have a degree in sculpture, not in drawing or painting. Because while I was at school, I was convinced by a friend uh, that the smartest thing to do with my tuition money would be to get the biggest studio space I could. And at that time at AU Arts, formerly ACAD, that was in the sculpture department. Not many people were doing sculpture. It wasn't cool. So of course that's where I found myself. So this is much different than drawing the structure that I did last week. You know, we're going to try to draw like cylindrical tubes, really. So that we can explain how the, the shapes fit together visually, how we design it and how we think about it. That's what I'm after, but also I want to take my time today. For me, drawing uh, is a very meditative experience. It's problem solving. I think the length of the head, I'm good there, in this case. The patella and the tibia tuberosity slightly going up and turning. We have this wedge. Just keep the feet simple. Length of the foot is equal to that spacing, so I'm good there. So just trying to say a little bit about what I'm thinking as I'm observing. If I measure the foot, that's my head measure. Shorten it a little bit, it's far away. And probably over exaggerating a little bit there. Okay, it would be the kneecap on this leg. Okay, so I've got almost everything blocked in. It's pretty good for, uh, what, seven minutes? Then we'll start taking our time, figuring out where everything goes. And let's see, actually, um, 
I'm drawing a little bit bigger, but you can get an idea of uh, that laying process, the architecture of the body. Uh, here's something interesting. So I blocked in a big shape for the hip, but there's a triangulation going from the elbow up the patella and then to the uh, kind of corner of this curve. Uh, and that is about where the great trochanter is. So I can run that up. And so I'm going to have a slope here. And up here, it comes down. So make sure you check your angles, test them out. That's why I frown upon uh, the use of a lot of curves at first, except for gesture. Uh, because we misjudge, I misjudge the same degree in the opposite direction. Pretty common problem. All right. Get that out of my way there. Soften that up. Okay. I'm going to zoom in for you guys a little bit. So, okay. It looks weird from your angle, I know, because it's over my shoulder right now. But I'm going to uh, assume that most things are right at this point and then work with them. That's just where I'm going to put the hand here. Something like that. Uh, I use things like I'll take this calf and I'll run straight across with my eyes on the piece and that shows me where the uh, olecranon is or the what I like to pronounce olecranon. That's the end uh, of the bowl, bone of the ulna, your elbow. You don't have to learn the names of these things. Uh, I'm still in the process of memorizing muscles. Being a teacher, that's useful, but uh, for most artists, you just have to know it's there, see it, observe it. You don't have to be able to understand it like a doctor does, right? Uh, another triangulation, I go from the elbow down, because really what I have here is a curve on this tube here. So I've got the forearm always fatter at the top and then it starts to straighten out so it goes from being a, a cylinder this so if I was if I cut your uh, arm down slices uh, here at the top it's big and round and as you're going down it kind of squares up right to the uh, wrist and the elbow I always like to say that it's it goes uh, angular at the joints or the landmarks. It's more squared off and then it's rounder here. Kind of like um, a drumstick or a turkey thigh. And although it's a person, that's not such a bad thing to be thinking uh, as you're drawing. If you don't have this picture and you're just following along or just out there listening, uh, I put it on the Atelier Artista website. You can just download it and practice. I would love to see your drawings if you are following along. Put them on social media as well. Tag away. It's the thing to do. So the length of the hand is, uh, from the elbow to the hand, it can be in thirds. So kind of the fat mound, this part, is about one third. And then to the 
uh, process of the ulna to the wrist is a third, and then the hand is a third, about. So I'm actually looking pretty good there. Keep it simple at first. You could look at this and say, oh, okay, well, it's a, it's a quarter over from this line. You know, just use your eye's ability to, you don't need numbers to measure things. Your eye is so accurate. With angles, with lengths. Everywhere you see a little bulge. It's overemphasized right now. Um, this is going to get rubbed down. And then I'm going to put the pan pastel in. And at the end, we'll do a critique of my work again up on the big screen. It's very fun. So... Be the eye line, the nose. Because it's foreshortened, the forehead is one third width bigger, the nose is smaller, and then all the way to the chin a little bit smaller. So just make sure that you're not keeping your thirds equal distance, make sure that they're getting smaller all the way. Because we see the bridge of the nose here, I'll just draw like a little arrow for now. The top lip is hidden. But we can't see the bottom lip. Every time I draw, uh, I to keep it exciting, I might be using a different approach. The thought process or the problem solving might change a little bit. I, I'm not thinking or squinting in this case on the darks and lights. I'm actually drawing illustratively, you know, like um, when you are on an airplane and you pull that little card out that shows you how to survive. It's kind of like a, an exterior simplified line drawing today. A lot of it's going to get obliterated, I think. But I'm just mapping myself out. Send on this bad boy. Right. Use the uh, same angle from the outside of the nostril. That's where your tear duct will be. So if I did that right, this distance should be the same width as in between them. That's how you find your tear duct the wings of the nose. All right, now I'm just going to block in the hair. It's fairly dark. Sarah's hair is always changing. Sometimes it's pink. Here she's a brunette for us. And in this case, the ear is in alignment uh, with the eye on this diagonal, this, this chin, uh, the nostrils, the brow, here. Yeah. 
So I did the head, but actually the hair gives us more volume. So we're going to get bigger than this space. It's on this side of the face. So if you're having problems seeing where something begins or ends, this is where you want to start squinting. Simplify. It's um, one, two, a little bit larger than two times the length of the face that we see. For now. I like to establish my darkest dark fairly early in the process. Uh, there's another one over here. Just because I find that my eye as it jumps around uh, really desires to balance things out. In the end this won't even be black probably. Um, I've got Fairly good umbers in the pastels. Oh, the lights came back on. That's good. Okay, double checking. So where is this shoulder going? It's almost in alignment with this nose. So I'll just use these relationships to find my way around this pose. Oh, and I'm rhyming. Bonus. Right here, there's a very uh, shadow dip and what that is is the clavicle which is going up the clavicle moves a lot on the body it's got some cartilage to help it move and rotate and it goes around and actually it's pointing this way but I have it kind of going that way. So I'm just going to erase and clean that up now. All right. So I'm not shadow mapping yet. I'm just going to keep going down. When I go straight up this forearm in the picture with my eyes, I come up, up on the thumb. So just using these uh, straight lines, vertical, horizontal, find where things are. and then just try to match the angles. So if I, I drop like a plumb line, it goes to the middle knuckle. This knuckle lines up to this knuckle. So it's straight, and then it gets bigger, fatter, at the top of the forearm. It's all big muscles up here, uh, and then long tendons and skinny muscles as it moves towards the wrist. And those tendons are what are pulling your, your fingers back. They have names like extensor digitorum, meaning to uh, extend out the digits. Let's check my angle again. That helps me uh, realize 
that some angles are off. I got to bring this a little more straight this way. And there is a tendon right there. So about halfway, you could look for the negative space in here as well. That would be very useful. Um, it's triangle essentially. And also, where's the crook? Where is this? If I run horizontally across, guess what? Tip of the nose. We're just trying to go a little slower, check, reference, and go a little bit more for accuracy. Halfway between this distance and this distance, I can see the shadow from beneath the breast. It's actually more straight and then round at the bottom. Maybe the nipple about here. And all this is in shadow inside here. Okay, I'm going to try to get up to the hip here by the time this beeper goes. So straight up. There's an overarching um, angle here, so I might raise the hip slightly. Going, I'm looking across the shoulder. It's like uh, being a printer or something, or laser sight uh, if you're building. Find the harmony between the shapes. If I go straight across from the elbow again, maybe at a slight angle, that is where her belly button is in this pose. So I've got as far as I feel like I need to. Bring this leg forward a little bit. So with this new pawn tomorrow timing, there it is, you can see it there. I find that about 30, before the last 30 seconds, I've kind of lost my focus. I'm going to clean it up a little bit, and then we're going to take a five-minute mental and visual break for ourselves. Maybe you need to clean up. Maybe you need to hydrate. Hydration is great for your brain. Ten seconds for our five-minute break. Uh, at the break, uh, I'm going to move the camera so it's straight on this drawing. Well, maybe not straight on, it's still tilted up a little bit. So that you can uh, see the time and work on training your eye. Whoops, sorry, I guess it's six minutes. Take six. for uh, Gil social media. I will be posting this, so. Get a little picture. Give that a little more.
hand drying towel. Long view here. What's going on? Keep it interesting. Just over a minute left. Don't have the overhead shot today. Just enough for you. Um, but I am keeping it dynamic by changing the view. This is my Costco car wash. I put in the laundry, uh, Costco car wash rag, and now I uh, use it on my hands because they only have air dryers here at C-Space and I find air dryers to be incredibly annoying, personally. Yeah, you're not touching anything, but I feel like you can't get the, the dirt from the charcoal off your hands. Let's just get this. Okay, so I'm ready for 25 more minutes. Uh, I've done the top half. I'll do the bottom half and then we'll go from the top down. I'll start mapping the shapes of the shadows. Twenty-five. Um, if you have erasers, it's it's really good to also get one of these. Um, it doesn't smudge your lines as much. I got this at a drafting store, this little broom, but you might have something around uh, your house. It's like a, I don't know, an old brush or something. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at the model again. I'm taking moments to take it in. I'm not just jumping in. I decided I, I wasn't, because I'm taking more time in drawing this. There's nothing I'm really going to have to alter, I don't think, uh, at this stage at least. I'm because I took more time. I'm just saying, hey, those are the proportions. They're good. They were comparative. Because this piece, I am going to play uh, with color. Uh, the photo, if you guys see, uh, it's very magenta looking. I actually enhanced this photo to share with you guys. I increased the contract uh, contrast because the lighting was really soft. There wasn't as much uh, definition in the shadows which for learning drawing and for 
uh, really showing that classical thing of like strong contraposte or, or those dark shadows. You definitely want to intensify that either by having a much brighter light or you can go into whatever software opens it up and increase the contrast. It does help understand and explain the shapes. So along the top I have this large, large shape. This is the, and it's straight, the rectus femoris. And on the side, another flat shape, which is the vastus externus. Um, I'm going to actually trim in this hip. I feel like my drawing is a lot more squished, uh, which means the same problem I have with uh, legs and stuff when I'm, I tend to make things uh, too wide. And so, although I've committed to this elbow length, uh, I can at least bring the hip in a little bit. It is still equal to the head length. So, it's not that different. I have actually a centimeter on my drawing. That's kind of a lot. But so I'm also you'll see that I'm holding my pencil very different in this session because I'm trying to draw lines. Normally I would be using the firm edge of my pencil and avoiding lines altogether. But this is going to get obliterated with the pastel. Oh, I'm getting a text from my watcher. Yes, pastels, Leah. We will be doing pa the pan pastels. I really want to get those lovely pastels Mr. Keith Springall is always using, those pencil ones, uh, pit pastel. Unfortunately, I have no money right now for that. That's going to be a big investment because you need to get all the colors, of course, right? Actually, Swinton's and the other art stores seem to be open now. Uh, although I've heard rumors, I haven't really uh, been out that much. I've heard rumors that most places are, are low on watercolor paper and uh, not super stock. But I do need some gesso for my tarot card series. I have been looking forward to that for years. It's going to happen this summer. Because I'm closed, uh, normally at this time of year, June to July, I am studying in Europe at various ateliers. So the atelier is not actually open at this time anyhow. So you're not missing out. If you're following along, you're getting bonus. When I've been gone, the lovely and talented Mr. Keith Springall runs the uh, figure nights which this will be part of. Okay, so here's a, here's a problem. Getting stuck in the hand up here already. Get out of there, move down. Um, horizontally speaking, the side of her body needs to be much smaller. As I mentioned, I might've drawn it too big. So that's one of the areas I just discovered by running at my eyes horizontally across the model's body. What does that align to? Okay, so we can also see uh, in between here and here on the model is actually the top of the patella. And there is kind of a vertical line in the shadow. And I'm just trying to find that because that's where the turn occurs of this leg, right? I'm trying to finish this shape off. Flattens out and then turns. Now this I will use a hard edged line because I want to give the impression that this leg is much more forward than the dark body uh, below. But we're going to see when we start putting in the shadows. When I, I'll just do a quick shadow map here. The shadow goes from the fold of the leg across her belly and it's slightly rounding on the belly. I, I don't know if that's too far. 
The cast shadow describes the form in which it's falling upon. So we don't need to draw this straight because we know that a leg is straight. We need to describe the roundness here, the softness and roundness of the belly. I'll do an example here on the arm. This leg is casting a shadow onto the arm. So that could be like that, right? But to better describe the arm, it would be better if I went this way to describe the roundness of the arm. Your drawing is a language. It's describing uh, visually what you want the viewer to read in it. And so we as artists have to enhance our focus on certain things in order to be more communicative. And then I'll go silent. Big, long lines here. You can break them down. You don't want to get too caught up. Uh, if I drop this line straight down, this leg is actually starting a little bit later. So you can see if my butt line was right here and I started the leg here, I'm like way off. This is your chance as you're refining and being more accurate to fix these things. Man, that thigh looks big. So I'm just gonna take a quick uh, measure. It's not as big as this hip. It's about that big and I'm good. Okay, I was getting a little worried. Sometimes there's these optical illusions. You gotta trust uh, your intuition for sure, but you also have to be able to be a little bit more empirical and uh, measure things out. This uh, length uh, is also equal to this length, which is equal to this length. Okay, we're good. So just cross-reference yourself. If you don't believe it's real, uh, check. Because now we start looking at the more uh, micro areas, getting focused on the smaller shapes. And you'll see when we draw our shadow shapes, uh, there's a different way of treating each, each type of line. So this foot's got to come in because on the uh, model, the foot is in the crevice. Maybe this crevice needs to go. Let me just take a measure. So it's about the length of the front of the face. So this is triangulation. I'm going diagonally. I'm measuring off from this point to this point because I can remain, keep that angle. And then I'm checking the length on the face and it goes just past the hair. So if I take that angle and go across, that puts my foot right there. And so my leg, if I go straight across, it's below the nipple. Okay, so that gives me this point. So I can change the, the fatty area here and move it up a little bit. It's a very small, subtle change, but that's what we're training is our observation. Not just how our hand glides this pencil uh, over the paper, ankle, malleolus, and then that nice curve. So if you're uh, not sure, draw the negative space. When I was teaching at AU Arts, I would put uh, a stool in the middle of the room. <laughs> God, I must have learned this from Richard Halliday. And then uh, get people to not draw the stool, but to draw the shapes uh, that make up the parts of the stool. 
it's a really good exercise to train your eye to see through something because we tend to think contour and mass like I have to draw this leg but you don't have to draw the leg at all you can draw the spaces around it so at this fold if this is exactly where it's supposed to be, which I kind of eyeballed it up off the trochanter, straight up is where the fold of the calf is going to be. And then I can take this ankle and go straight across, and I've located it. So I locate it this way, and I locate it this way. And in classical drawing, you learn a lot of location like that. A lot of locating, making these little points, almost like connecting the dots. All right, I'm going to just move her up a little bit. I see she's sliding in your guys' view. Not in my view, though, so I apologize for that. Uh, there are multiple cameras here. Okay. So just building on my angles, this line connects down. The malleolus sticks up, but I can just follow it down. Connect that line through. I just want to take a measure as well of the width of my foot and compare it to the head. It appears to me that this foot uh, is getting too wide. So I need to trim it down. Just take a measure. Compare it to something that you've already set. It could be the width of this arm. Um, you could just be working this lower side. But just check. We check all the way so that we can improve our accuracy. Rome was not built in a day, and neither are our drawings. In fact, what? We're second 25 minute set. So we could, by the time I've done this bit, I would say that I've been drawing about an hour. I know it's been a little bit less, but I'd rather be very effective in my hour by taking my time. Often in figure drawing, I'm scribbling a lot more than this. So I'm just taking my time because I'm offering a lot more uh, of my vision and instruction tonight. Because I'm not doing the... Uh, had too many problems with the streaming on the Fridays and it feels too late for me to restart that class right now but it'll come again from the foot straight down that is where the patella begins so that becomes the whole length of the leg for me and now it curves up this is the leg going away from me, foreshortened, curves up, curves in. If you don't know all your parts of your anatomy, I'm just going to draw in uh, the shape a little bit. Just so you can see what we're talking about. The patella, which is quite small, would look like this. So this would be the top of the bone. And it's a trapezoid kind of shape. Oops. So a slight angle. So inside um, the leg, and then we have this point of the bone and the tibia tuberosity going away in perspective. Straight across from where this little pinky toe is, or uh, where this fold is, we have continuation for the ankle bone and it kind of sits there's like an arc across the foot so I mean this looks like I could draw in like those stirrups girls wore in the 80s the stirrup pants the camera is going sorry just getting a little feedback 
is okay let's see hopefully it's not putting a square around okay bring the foot down there's an arc here at the top and I might as well copy that angle of the tendon from the top of the foot. I like drawing feet a lot. They are abstract uh, to me. I don't think of them like, hands can be very confusing. Maybe because we're always looking and using them, but feet, uh, they're not like weird hands to me. They're something altogether different. Especially when you got all those wrinkles on the bottom. I wouldn't make art just out of them though, because most people don't like feet. So, I'm not going to be a foot portraitist. There's probably somebody out there who would love that, but they're called perverts. All right, I've got seven minutes here. I've got a pretty good uh, land. I want to go through and finish my shadow mapping and I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit about it. So the cast shadow from this leg is draping over the roundness of this cylinder, right? So. I want to curl, even enhance it more, because actually this part of the leg is rather flat on the um, inside of the leg. This is the vastus internus. It's a very flat area um, coming up, whereas uh, across here we have uh, the scotorius, which is pulling this in. Okay, so I'm just going to curl it and then. It comes down. Now the cast shadow is crossing a core shadow. But when I draw a cast shadow, I use the tip of the pencil and I make it a hard edge. Now the value of a cast shadow and a core shadow, I treat the same. But the uh, line quality I change. So I'm going to use the side of my pencil and I'm going to go the direction of the form to get this shadow. You see how it's much softer already? Cast shadows are usually a harder edge, and then core shadows, which follow the direction of the form, softer. So we're going to go down, and it's going to go along the patella. You could also go this direction, but make little lines so it's a little bit softer. Okay. Turns around the form, the tibia tuberosity, down the shin bone, all the way to where this ankle is. That's my alarm to work out. So in the next break, uh, I got to do 30 push-ups, sit-ups, squats. So you're going to hear that in the background. Okay. And uh, along, there's a negative space here between the toe. There's a cast shadow along the toe. And then it, the shadow travels down. It's like a V-shape. And same as the one underneath. So just draw the light and dark shapes and then just shade in anything below that shadow line. So simple at first. You don't have to draw all the nuances, but we've been very careful uh, all the way through. Now something that's quite subtle here is that there is a little bit of light catching below the patella, just catching a little bit of the leg here. Uh, I'm just going to shade all this in so that you guys can see that work I previously did. All of this is a shadow. So you want to have tone on there. There might be darker areas. We'll draw those in later after some color is put onto this. Uh, between uh, and below the ankle or malleolus, 
Uh, we have the shadow coming down from the tendon down the foot. So it's a firmer edge because it's falling over uh, a tendon and a little bit of vein action here. And then it's going to follow quite firmly, but cup a little bit, along the front of the shin bone. And there's a little V uh, of where the tibia tuberosity below the patella ends. So it looks like this. A little bit of V because a little shadow is caught by that, the crest of that shin bone. And all of that will be darkened. I am going to put a color on top of this. I'll separate the colors. Hopefully the camera picks it up um, clearly. We'll see. Following the direction of the form, the patella, slightly angled. That separation, slightly angled. Oops, not that separation. So hopefully, while I'm talking, um, these are not exactly the thoughts that go in my mind while I'm drawing. Uh, it's much more calm and silent, but I gotta talk to keep this interesting, right? Um, but I'm shading the direction of the form. The direction of the form. When we put our smaller shapes, so these are the big simple shapes, when we put our smaller shapes in, we're gonna go uh, across the form. And by having those two directional languages, uh, it will make our work a lot more interesting. So if nothing else, you learned one of the greatest secrets, I think, of drawing that I've found over the years that I've learned. No one told me that. Uh, just a way of expressing kind of what I've observed. So from the elbow, yeah, is a fairly, it's arcing up a fairly uh, firm shadow following along the forearm. It's because it's flatter there. And then it softens out as we go down. And I would uh, argue that all of this is actually in shadow within there. This one just happens to be darker. We'll do that by adding uh, more material on top. Put shadow on the breast. Soft light is hard for people to learn from at first. But if you learn your fundamentals, and that's really where all this is, it won't matter what the light is. Because you'll be able to understand uh, what to do. So. This cast shadow is a lot further away from this elbow. So it is going to be a lot softer. Now I feel like I'm at the end of my focus. And look, 30 seconds. That's kind of where I am with the uh, quantum model timing here, I think. So I'm going to stop. I'll finish a little bit more shadow mapping in the next session. And then we'll get into the color. This is my workout break. So I'm going to do it as fast as I can in five minutes. I will uh, realign the camera once again so that you can see more straight on uh, what I've created. So take a break, please. Five minute break. All right. There we go. In fact, let me go out so that you can see the camera. It's running off. Maybe you smoke. Nobody really smokes these days. Maybe you need to take a pee or get some food. You're joining me for 30 jumping jacks as well. push it out.
Three squats. Thirty sit ups. Minute and a half left. Oh, such a delay on this. Okay. Thank you, Leah. Anytime I move the camera, I gotta wait 20 seconds to see what it does. Maybe one of these days I'll film my little workout. Okay, it's not moving. That's good. Okay. I'm just going to take a picture for the social media as well. I put, um, I'm going to share my drawings and share the steps. Just move this camera back to where we were, hopefully. Ooh, that looks good on the screen. No, it was 20 seconds. There is a delay for me. So 25 more minutes. Hopefully this is in the screen for you. It's going to finish off with the shadow mapping. So uh, I'm going to go to uh, the outside of the arm right here. There is a curved shape. Uh, that's the bone, the condyle of the uh, Bone that's like, you know, when you draw bones, they've got those two little funny sides of condyle, and it goes straight down. In fact, it looks to me that my arm needs to be moved over a little bit. Sometimes the shadow mapping can help you find where you are. I went in there pretty confidently. I'm surprised it's off a little bit. Every time you draw, you have to think about what is your purpose. Today I wanted to take my time and shoot a little more for accuracy. So I'm not noodling around this time. Uh, there's not a lot of erasing. I'm kind of just attacking uh, where I think the line is. So, and then 
you know, you might be just working on proportions that day, but have something in mind to improve upon. So I'm going to turn this line because it, the arm is circling around. Now, you might have to really squint your eyes uh, on your version to see these things. I did enhance them. Uh, that, or you just have to imagine a cylinder, really. From here, we have a, a curl, turns with the gravity and weight of the bicep, and then curls this way. So these are core shadows, core form or terminator line, side bug line, with shadow mapping in here. The light's coming like this at a slight angle, and so it's turning along this form. Light is peeking in, and there's a path shadow, so a hard edge, the point of my pencil, and the core goes this way. So it's just it's like a little puzzle that we're figuring out. We're going to revisit the shadow map when we introduce the pastels in color. We'll be fortifying this. And then maybe at the end, having to draw out some more of these things uh, to make sure that the language that we're speaking is obvious. To make sure that the viewer knows what we're trying to tell them. So there's a fold um, under the arm here from the neck. But what I want to describe, I'll do it with a hard line at first, is how this shadow mapping is showing me the roundness of the form that's in the light. So by doing this roundness, we get a sense of how uh, the light is falling, and that gives these things in the light shape. It gives it mass and form. Like You don't want to go just straight across. It's not straight across. In fact, I'm going to do it a little bit more angle. We already had that one from the beginning. And it goes around the shoulder down and from this arm there's a cast shadow because it's touching the flesh of this shoulder and there's a little roundness of the shoulder and a fold and a divot like that. Cast shadows are really important. They're what lifts things up. It brings this arm more forward. I'm going to take that divot out of there. It's a little bit intense. Okay, so I'm nearly done my mapping here. I'm just going to round the shoulder out a little bit more. And separate the roundness of the shoulder from the trap. There are also cast shadows below her, but we don't need to worry about those yet. I'm just going to draw a line that describes the rosary falling on her hand, curling. I would put the beads on top of this line. Rather than try to draw the beads and have it uh, go out of whack. And at the very front of her hand, just a little line here. That's a very small detail, and the reason I'm not drawing it in is because it will get eradicated in the next step. This whole hand is in shadow. It's also cut off by the uh, fabric on the ground. The ring across his finger. So I'm just looking for what's light, what's dark. Might be getting a little boxy here. Just a long day with these things. 
So it, it, it's dangerous because if you draw too much of what you know, uh, you know, it's going to look like a lion's paw. Not like a human hand. But what I'm after is how the shadow falls down over the knuckle to the last phalange and down the finger. That's all in shadow. There are some areas that I can pull out either with my eraser. So the tip of the knuckle across the tendon. Same as down here. Just a little bit. So all of this I want to put tone on. Some folds, some tendons, some veins. It's all there, but look at the main source is that this goes this way. Okay? Just clean it up a little bit. I'm being very trying to be a lot more accurate. Take my time. This is like creating kind of a cutout. There are um, a lot of lost edges in here, but we're going to deal with those with color. So I'm cleaning up anything that's going to have color because I don't want to adulterate it too much with um, this charcoal. This is an HB charcoal. So if you think about how pencils are, uh, this is a much firmer charcoal. Whereas a later, I'll go over top of it with a much softer charcoal. These. So I'm just going to look around, see if there's anything else here I can do. Maybe take a quick snapshot for the old social media and then going to add color. Just soften it up. This paper is quite smooth and quite robust, although I don't want to overdraw into it or over erase because erasing also wrecks the tooth of the paper. I'm not going to put the shadows um, in the charcoal, she's laying on white, and what I want to do is make those very, very cool shadows, maybe even go as far as just doing blue, to really bring out the warm flesh tones that I'm going to use. So, let's see what we have here. There was a pen, oh yeah, pan pastel. Okay, so I'm going to use this raw umber shape along the core shadow, and the burnt sienna along the rest. So I'm going to have a cool core, a cool cast, but a warm reflected light and a warm skin. That way I can utilize Ruben's rhythms a little bit. Last week I didn't clean off the tools, um, so I'm just going to use them as is. That's the one thing about these pastels is that you got to buy a lot of these um, tools and two-tippy things because as, as you can see this is already so dirty. I think this is my raw umber shade. It looks a lot different in the picture. Looks like red is black but um, this is going to be my core. In fact I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use a stump instead um, to draw it. Oh, it works. That was totally an experiment. I'm not going to lie. So I'm following my core shadow and I'm rubbing the material in with the stump. I want it to be uh, a little bit softer, so this is a good way of doing it, I think. So the core is cool, the cast shadow is cool, but the actual shadow will make it warm in this case. So follow those lines you plan. If you're following along and doing color with me today. So, last week I used very big tools, uh, but 
In this case, I'm going to be trying to be more accurate. In fact, this could turn a little more so that roundness of the light. Let's try this tool now. Okay, you know what? It feels still better. So you gotta spend the money on these things. So just mapping, you can use the edge. I'm still new at this. If you want a pro, I'll just keep spring off. This is his uh, wheelhouse, I think. He's got this stuff down. It is nice and quick, which makes it very enjoyable to use it. And a lot like painting. So cast shadows, as I said, are going to be the cool dark. It's going to help offset the flesh. Plus we can ride a little bit of pastel right on top of it. I'm going to be mindful now of lost edges. From here to here, there's a lost edge. So I can start blurring out some of my lines. Some of these will get darkened on top, so I'll increase their value uh, even more in the final stage. It's all time willing, of course, and I'm working very slow and methodical today. Kind of like when you read a book for enjoyment, you take your time, you let the words sound out in your mind. Sarah has a little charity face, so I want to be sure to uh, emphasize the roundness of the smile. This is a lost edge right here, so I have to erase it. Otherwise, the chin ends up looking too big and pointy. All oh, that's a lost edge. A little piece of light underneath this, you might want to emphasize because there's that little triangle there and some more depth. Anything that we can use to our advantage to further the illusion of depth will make our piece look better and more interesting to the viewer's eyes. Since this is an illusion all around, that's what we're trying to impress upon. And then you know, people think, oh my god, look at how real that looks. A human has manipulated how we see in this piece of art, just with techniques. Why people, even if they say, I don't know about art, you know, they still go to museums. People still, you know, you go to Europe, you don't just eat the food, you gotta go to museums too. It's the thing to do, right? It's the cultural thing to do. All right. The reason I don't make these images black and white is because, well, when you're first learning, that's good, because our models aren't black and white in real life. You guys at home, when you print them out on your home printer, that's fine if you reduce the values. The home printers don't do a great job, but they'll get you most of the way there. But we need to train our eye to see value, to see black and white, which is a real challenge. In my drawing classes, I, I've noticed, to be fair, it takes people with study, about three months 
to be able to see them better. This pastel certainly goes on creamy and beautiful like paint. It's not going to stay there forever, unfortunately. I'm just going to pull uh, the pastel over a little bit uh, and soften in some areas. You can see uh, in your reference, pull it up, some softening. It will get darkened back on top. You can kind of see what's going on there. Look at the bottom of the foot. Oh, sorry, my head's in the way. Balancing a lot of things here. And I turn the brush to match the form I'm trying to describe. So that's the smaller shapes. The big shapes you can go along the direction of the form, say like this, this way. And the smaller shapes go this way, go cross contour. So I'm almost done my darkest dark my cool dark, okay, uh, I think it looks pretty good. And we've got a plan moving forward. I want to give you guys a plan so you have a process to uh, forget about judgment in yourself. So. That's, we're going to call that the darks. The reflected light, which is the lightest dark, uh, is a lot warmer. A lot warmer. So I want to find that burnt sienna. It's very reddish. And this will intensify the turning of the form. So I'll follow it along everywhere that light is reflecting up. So along the edges. And then blend those two together. This is a very, very intense color. Lots of chroma in it. So some dark's still going to sit over top. So the body, I like this leg, is reflecting up. And that creates a very warm uh, reflection. We don't see as much over here. But she's on a white sheet. There is a, a light line, so it's slightly brighter, the reflected light, in value. It comes down the leg. And I've found that on figure models, it tends to kind of reflect like the warmth of their body. It looks redder. Maybe a little bit on the knee. light bit under here. She's very close so there's not a lot of reflecting light. What else? Right in here. Reflected light. So look more for the lightness of it and not the color per se. She does have very red cheeks. And the ear you could probably do with this. To start, there's going to be some layering on top. I'll probably lose her cheeks up a little bit more. And this crook of this neck is incredibly red. A little bit along this line. Let me just move up so the picture looks good there. A little bit along this bust. Right? This body is reflecting up. So that's where you put, you're changing not just the value, slightly brighter dark, we're also giving it warmth. Lots in the hands because the blood is all in those fingertips. So I'm just looking around the body now and I realize I missed the breast is reflecting up into this inner arm. So you got to think about all these light sources as we go. So I'm going to make it redder. If you squint your eyes, 
Um, you want these to be fairly close to each other. I'm finding that this umber is not dark enough, so I will be, when I go over it with the charcoal again, that's really going to help me out. So redness on the forearm, maybe a little on this bicep, this one bouncing in here. So I'm just going to soften that all up. I got three minutes left, so I'm going to put in uh, some more uh, the half tone. Here it's uh, also a little bit cooler. So I'm just going to take a little bit of this umber just to cool down whatever. Oh, that's not cool. Just to help cool down whatever um, color is going to sit on top. Okay. So now she's uh, quite orange, and in terms of what I have, I don't have things really, really orange here, unfortunately. Red iron oxide tint is what I have. Oh, there's one called orange tint. Okay. So many of these. I could go the way of pinkish too if I need to. Burnt sienna tint. That looks like orange tint. This looks like it will work. I'm going to use a different tool because that other tool was for the darks. So I'm going to use this little thing here, this eye makeup thing. That's a that's a burnt sienna. What what was I using? Okay, let's use that. It's very orange, which is nice. So along oh yeah, that's going to work nice along all the outsides of the form. I'll use this and the turning of the form. So from the core shadow up. The core is cool, the half tone is warm. In this case, because I'm playing with the color. This looks like Ken and Barbie skin color here. But it's quite orange, which is what I'm after. Not so far different. Let's put some on top. You almost can't see the difference when I put it right on top. Once again, these are enhanced. More red on the knees. So I'll add red later and blend right on top. Here, even more reddish, probably. But we'll just blend on top. More red. So it's like I'm mostly filling in. There will be places I erase out to make it lighter, of course. The arms and stuff up here is a lot cooler. Put a little bit of this up here. So, normally, this would be our long break. We're halfway. But because I do the crit at the end, I don't take a long break. We're going to reset the uh, camera to face and just give us a five minute break. Enjoy it. Freshen up. All right, turn this camera straight on again. I feel like this one's getting lower. There we go.
Dry your hands. I am on day nine of the master cleanse. Tonight, after this, I get to get on my bicycle, bomb down the hill to this, and there is bone broth waiting for me. So that's the closest thing to eating I've done in well over a week. All I've been doing is drinking this beverage and peeing every 30 minutes. I do this three to four times a year to maintain my focus and health. And I got to tell you, I am feeling fantastic. I am also looking forward to bombing down 14 on my bike because it's nice out. It's summer. In Calgary. Zooming out. 20 more seconds. Let's give you. A view of the scene, how the artist lives, and the little bit of mess over here. Um, I haven't been using this example, but what's up on the screen is what my laptop sees. You see how many screens are on there? There is a delay of about 20 seconds, otherwise we get feedback, uh, visual feedback. So let me just reposition. I hope the view is good and the chatter is even better for you guys. Maybe I'll get a little closer this time. So right now it looks pretty rudimentary in my opinion. Uh, there's going to be lots of softening going on between things. 25 minutes. So we've got three more sittings to call this thing finished. We'll see how that goes. So I got lots of the orange. Uh, I'm going to soften off this color now and cool it off, right? So they're about the same value, but this one's cooler. So as the light's moving towards uh, and away, uh, I observe that she looks more cooler. So I'm just going to use this color now for those areas. Right, the turning of the form. So it goes further away. It's lighter here, but as it turns around the body, even here I'll do cooler. And there's a little bit of it coming to towards us because she has abs and she was laughing. Here I might actually warm up after. Uh, the leg might be reflecting up a little bit. But this whole part of the arm, cooler. So same value, cooler color. Color is a fun and complicated thing. But when you start to get it, uh, it creates very interesting challenges. The hands, I'm going to go a little bit redder. So cooler here, cooler. So the turning of the neck. I gotta show that it's roundness going across the corner. Not this way, but this way. Okay? Alright. I'll move that up for you. Gotta pay attention to this, bunny. What? Did I go too far? I need a camera person. Sorry, I just got to get up off the seat. It seems like the camera version uh, is tilted more up than what you guys are seeing. Okay. So the lights are going to sit on top of this. I'm treating it uh, very similar to how I would deal with uh, an oil painting, dark to light. Uh, the neck is different val or different color, same value. There's a lot more pink at the top. So 
I'm going to see if I have a color that represents that. So far, uh, this is kind of what ah, we're looking at. So the reflected light and lights, the dark, which is cooler, but not as dark as I would like. I'm just going to check another pile of these. So there's a color here, which will make for not the brightest light, uh, a little bit pinker, but the light. So I will find a tool and put that in. Should give me a range here. Okay, this is clean. So along the uh, patella. Oh, that's nice. I could almost get away with just rubbing and leaving this uh, paper behind. But we need something creamy on here. So along the patella, and I can just put a little bit more light on there. The foot for sure. So this is very close to the paper color on there. I'm using it to blend in with what I have on there, so it's brightening it up a little bit. Still orange, not as orange, knocking it back. Maybe you don't believe it, but I'm making this up as I go. I will be pinking it up as well. So if you have to, squint your eyes, and but squint them down so you only see what are the shape of the lights. So it doesn't belong here, but I'm rubbing it in hard to get that color to blend. So I'm using it like blending. These are This is a lost edge right here. Between here and here, should be no line. So I'm just going to eradicate as much as I can and rub those two together. I love the lost edges. Um, when I went to study in uh, Amsterdam or Holland in general, I really enjoyed seeing uh, Rembrandt's work and how he dealt with them. To me, uh, the understanding the soft edges is the highest level for me because I, I came from a cartooning and illustrative background. And so everything was line already. Whereas other people are a lot more already ambiguous with what they're drawing. And so that's not a lesson for them per se. They already understand softness and ambiguity. But it's definitely an important thing to get right. Because that is what mimics the look of how your eyes see. Uh oh, someone's calling me. Just like when I drive, I don't answer the phone when I'm drawing. Okay, there's a dark line underneath that I need to release first. I pick it up if it was you, Pete. But I'd be really worried about what I was doing wrong you felt the need that you had to call all of a sudden. The forehead is catching a bit more light. The bridge of the nose. I'll be taking out, um, and, and then the teeth can be the same color pretty much as the skin, uh, the lightest part. We're going to add lots of rosiness to her cheeks. She looks like a little chipmunk in this. Uh, the breast is also this cooler light. Okay. Uh, a little bit longer, so I guess. 
All right, so now I got to find something that's a little bit pinker. Pinker. I've got three more stacks. There's a literal pink. Okay. You can try it. I'm not afraid. Let's put it on the hands. Oh, it is not as dark as I thought it was going to be. Let me use that a little bit in her cheeks. It's a very cool pink. Not exactly what we need. I'm going to use the uh, burnt sienna for the nipples. They're quite dark in value. So she's a lot warmer right now. Um, that's what we wanted to enhance. Got to find another. That's kind of pinkish. Let's try that on the hands. Okay, that's got more chroma in it at least. Use that in the face as well. I'll probably use the red in here. The very, very strong red that they give you. She's a little too lit there, but. So hands, more pinkish. Elbows tend to be more pinkish. Knees, more pinkish. Let's try to add the crazy red. Where are you, red? I'm going to try it with my stump for the first time. I've never done this before. This is not my regular modus operandi. Oh, not bad. Let's try her cheeks, adding the red in. Not terrible. A little strong. The cheeks are really rosy. And a little bit along the chin. This is where those hip pastels might come in handy. Sarah has these lovely little dimples around here. Gotta get those in. So I'm back on the pencil a little bit, just enhancing some areas. So I got the cool skin color here. All right, some shadows in the eyes. I'm just getting more coloring because right now she looks like a clown in my drawing, not in real life. But just using a stump to rub the color in. Because the tools that they come with are a little too um, a little too dull, I guess. Like they do big marks, but they don't do these tiny little fine things that I need them to do. A little bit more red. Red in this hand. Too light. Pink was far too light and rugged. A little bit more red. Oh, a little bit more of the red here. Warm it up. Warm that up. Putting a 
a little more color. Okay, I feel like uh, it's getting a little out of control for me. So, oh, a little more red in this ear too. What I'm going to do is draw a little bit, again, with the darks. And clean up some of the edge work. So I'm using a different charcoal now, very, very soft charcoal. And I'm going to intensify. I don't know if you can see that. There we go. Intensify uh, my darkest darks again. So a little bit of drawing going on here. Just so that I don't lose some of the angles of the line work. And I keep the thickness and thinness uh, undulating, like it gets thicker and thinner, harder and softer, straight and curved. Keeps it interesting. The hair actually looks really burgundy, like a reddish brown. So maybe I'll put a color on top, we'll see. But I'm gonna make this hair the darkest value. So I have something to compare things to. A little earring in there too. Sometimes just picking out these little details, um, this is my eraser, helps make it look like you did a lot more work than you did. Well, I can't find my regular eraser, but I got this eraser. Maybe after I put these darks in, let's put some cool blue shadows underneath the model to help raise it off the scene. That'll be fun. Kind of leave some of this texture in here. Let me just see what happens when I take my chamois to it. Oh, wait. I'll use this foam brush. Hmm. It lightens it quite a bit. Gotta layer it. Some of the uh, beads here look near black, so we'll just put a few in. And it will trick the mind into thinking you did a lot more work than you did. I like to work smart. Get some mileage out of this. Almost, almost lost edge here. I'll just smooth that out. There we go. There's a shadow under the nipple there. I 
And actually, I'll get the eraser in the next one. I can lighten that elbow. It's quite dark right now. Now I mentioned earlier about some of the shadows being darker. So this is where I'm enhancing them. We build up darks by layering them on top of more and more material. This color is not exactly what I wanted. I think uh, an Indian red would have been a lot uh, better for my needs. Maybe that's what I'll buy in the can in the pastel, the pit pastel. All right, let's get this just a little bit of a mess this right here. Definitely darken uh, the lashes. Maybe even draw a little bit of lashes there. I don't know if I'll have much time to come back up to this face. I'm doing those nose ring shadow. I, I would actually go as far as saying all of this needs to be darker. I'm just using the side of my device here. Maybe slightly shade it out. Black really doesn't... Um, doesn't read as a color. So you want to be a little bit cautious. This is becoming a little bit drawerly, which is okay. It's a drawing. I'm not trying to, in this amount of time, create a Bouguereau level piece of art that people will be like, oh my god, is that a photo or is that a drawing? No, it's a drawing. It's art. Our brain wants us to be so factual and say what's real and what isn't. But uh, you got to keep the artistic stuff in there, too. I'm going to move the belly button down. It looks a little high. 